So allow me to briefly introduce each panelist. So we have with us today, Fernando Perez. Hi, Fernando. So he's a journalist and Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health from the Global Brain Health Institute. And one of the things he really wanted me to mention uh, that is very significant about him is of, about him being a grandchild and his relationship with his grandma in helping him to understand and navigate this journey. He's a very, very passionate grandson and we look forward to hearing more about his views later. Next, we have our speaker, Meryl Comer. She's co-founder and chair of Global Alliance on Women's Brain Health. She was caregiver to her husband with Alzheimer's, who's recently passed on, a former veteran broadcast journalist, author of New York Times bestseller, Slow Dancing with a Stranger, which 100% of the proceeds go to Alzheimer's research. And as mentioned earlier, also uh, co-founder and chair of the Global Alliance on Women's Health. Our next speaker is Kristen Clifford. She's the Chief Program Officer for Alzheimer's Association. Her grandmother, Emma, was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in the late 1980s. And her family's journey with the grandma was over 15 years. And with that, she's very driven by this mission uh, together with the Alzheimer's Association to try to provide the support, education and empowerment for people living with dementia, as well as their family members and caregivers. And hopefully give people access to the services that her, her own family may not have had previously when they were looking after. Our next speaker is Lissalette Jensen, Secretary General of Alzheimer's Fondant. Her mother had Alzheimer's and it's a, it's a very personal journey for her as well. And she really wants to focus her support on research and funding so that hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we can find a treatment for Alzheimer's and also to spread that knowledge and global insight on dementia, breaking the stigma that it's not just part of growing old, it's a brain disease. We also have with us today, Adi Raphael, social worker from EMDA Alzheimer's Association of Israel. She specializes in old age and dementia in the last 15 years, and she's been through various phases of this subject matter. She's worked in a home, ran a daycare center as well for people with dementia. So with that, we welcome all our panelists today on this town hall. Before we start formally into the discussions, um, Meryl Comer, also has a presentation that will give us some insights to what is happening. Um, it's called the A-List. Um, it's got some research findings on what was gathered on how um, the situation was during the COVID-19 pandemic period. So over to you, Meryl. Thank you, Janice, and thank you to the organizers for taking on this critical issue. You know, ironically, the global pandemic gave the world a taste of the challenges, vulnerabilities, and fear of what's next that impacts the lives of every ADRD family in the best of times. So I'd like to share our findings from Us Against Alzheimer's A-List. It was a year long COVID impact survey series, eight series, eight surveys of all in the United States. Let's go to the next slide, please. The a-List uh, is an online community of over 8,000 people living or caring for someone with the disease. Uh, our thinking as advocates when we first launched it was, everyone has a story to tell, but the power lies in the combination of evidence-based research and open commentary that produces what we like to call data with soul. And we always give the data back in a pulse of the community to support families in knowing that they're not alone, and it also guides our advocacy. Uh, April 20 to March 2021, the results of growing crisis of ongoing stress, severe stress of people reporting uh, dementia, rapid decline. By March survey of this year, 84%, one or more stress symptoms typically found in people with severe stress. And if you just take a look at those stressors, vigilance, sleep problems, many of the problems we all shared, but this is uh, significant. This A-list data was reviewed by Cohen Veteran Science to analyze 
whether these results met the threshold for the specific diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, it was close, but they uh, characterized it as extreme uh, stress. And not surprisingly, over 40% of survey respondents with MCI believe their cognition had declined. 70% of caregivers reported an even greater effect on cognition and decline in the memories of their loved ones. Next slide, please. The byproducts of stress, and this is critical in terms of care support. 80% of current caregivers negative emotions in their caregiver roles, 41%, uh, but sheltering in place created additional tension among families, keeping a loved one with dementia at home. 22% uh, of caregivers say physical or mental changes affected their ability to care for a loved one. And three fourths of those taking care of a person with Alzheimer's at home reported they did not have a backup plan should the caregiver get COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, Janice, you alluded to this, but deaths in long-term care facilities accounted for more than uh, one third of all COVID-19 deaths in the United States for much of the pandemic. Uh, visitor restrictions meant long separations from family, higher stress levels, and too often these days removing an important connection and for many families, a missed chance to say goodbye. And that impact of so many lives lost has created what doctors are now calling a debilitating prolonged grief syndrome that we have to address. So what's true for all of us, our resilience has been tested. It will continue to be tested. There will be another crisis and will, be, will we be ready? So there can only be one answer, and I think that's why we're here, Janice. Back to you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Well, you did you did do it in 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 a in a very short period of time to share with us all these insights. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Um, you know, let, let's start by doing a round with uh, the rest of the panelists as well. You know, what happened in in your organizations and your experience during the pandemic that you would like to share the most uh, with the audience? Uh, Lisa, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, I mean, we are a uh, funding organization, as you might understand. And uh, actually, uh, 2020 was a sad year, but it was actually the best year ever fi in financial terms for us. And that shows the, the terrible practical thing that most of the people who lived at uh, retirement homes or dementia homes Actually, the ones who died first in COVID-19 was this vulnerable group. So we have, have never had so many, um, if you say, funeral donations as we had during 2020. And also a lot of people who had lived their wills, testaments to us. So we actually had our best financial year. So, and the good thing with, with that was that we could really distribute a huge amount of grants, research grants to the researchers. But it was a sad story because we, we saw in very practical terms that the vulnerable group who died first was those with cognitive impairment. And, mm -hmm. and knowing that and, and that all these people were sort of dying on their own in the dementia in, in the care homes was uh, really awful. But the good things is that uh, uh, we could really provide the researchers very necessary re funding. Uh, but it was a very strange year in that respect, but it shows what happens in, in, in practice. Mm -hmm. And we also had finally shortly, a lot of people who called us who wanted to have help in order to how they should treat their loved ones and so forth. So it was a very special year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over to you, Kristen, would you like to share? Yes, I'm happy to. It's nice to be with everyone today. I think, um, Merrill did a nice job of highlighting some of the data around what this looked like. And for our organization, really thinking about um, how we could support, support the healthcare provider community, those who are living with Alzheimer's and other dementias, and also their caregivers. There is uh, data that's beginning to emerge that really looks at the experience for dementia caregiving during COVID. Um, for example, family caregivers who are able to engage in more direct phone and email contact with relatives and long-term care 
residencies indicated greater emotional well-being for themselves and their relatives, whereas uh, relying on residential care staff alone rather than family members resulted in lower perceived well-being. Uh, so we looked at some of those um, types of things to understand what that emotional well-being can look like for families. I think COVID-19 also laid bare for us and really exacerbated what those structural inequities are and how residential long-term care is financed and regulated in the United States. Um, and so we're looking at that from a policy perspective. I think it also highlighted for us the lack of preparation of many residential long-term care settings to effectively manage and contain the rapid spread of, of the virus um, and had a detrimental effect, devastating effect, not only in residents and their family caregivers in regards to their social well-being and, and their mental health, but also on the professional care staff. So trying to understand what we can learn from all of that. And then, of course, as an organization that also um, funds and leads research, we're also working um, with more than 25 countries with technical guidance from the World Health Organization um, on a, a study that really aims to better understand the long-term consequences that may impact the brain, cognition, and function, including the underlying biology that may contribute to Alzheimer's and other dementias. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we would like to hear from Fernando next. Hi, Janice. Thank you. So in my country, actually, the huge challenge was to move from the in-person uh, assistance to the technology. Uh, we are talking about a low and middle income country. And in Brazil, unfortunately, we don't have this philanthropy culture as in other continents. So our Alzheimer's Association works with few resources comparing to US and Europe. So all our meetings were held in person. And then during the pandemic, that was not possible anymore. And we saw ourselves without the data from the families. We couldn't call the families saying, well, for the next month, we are not uh, meeting you in person but we will have a link. We are moving for the virtual mode. So it was, we had to rush to, to connect with these families, but then we have another challenge to face. Brazil is not prepared for the technology, for the connections. We are not fully prepared. This generation, uh, they, they are just knowing this structure, this virtual structure now, and most of them were not prepared for that. So they needed the, the, the other generation to help them connect to us. And this was a huge challenge to, to find these assisted families and to show them that we are still here, but in a different way. And we, we are still trying to, to connect with, with these families. And I saw as well that during the pandemic, we, we collected way more data than before because Brazil was, almost always working, uh, comparing data from other countries and estimating something for Latin America and for Brazil. And within these two last years, we collected a lot of data and we published a lot of uh, studies with this data from Brazil. And with this, the professionals had a, a broader perspective on dementia here. So I saw these two movements happening here. Great, thanks for sharing. Uh, Adi, um, can you share with us your perspective what happened? Yes, I will be happy to. This is a very important subject. Well, I think that Israel is a little bit different than the rest of the world. First, we are a very small country. And second, we have a really organized medical system and a lot of help from the government. And the good thing that happened to us from this pandemic, which was really terrible, is that it, it got up all the awareness to the, to the old people, to dementia, to the needs of the old people. And we have a lot of programs now that are for them and we have a lot of organized organizations and services that contribute to their wealth welfare and their own living life at their home at MDA, what we did was that we took all this technology and we did a lot of things that usually we do it 
on real life by Zoom. And it helped us a lot. We found out that Zoom is a really good technological way to get to people and to make it even better than in the real life. And we still today, after we, ad- we don't have COVID here anymore, we still today use it as, in, as we used it during the pandemic. And we found it as a really good tool. I have to say that our culture is very familiar and we are all the time gathering together. The loneliness and the isolations, it was terrible for us and for all of us, especially for the old people. So what happened here is that neighbors and volunteers helped us to, to come through to the old people, to give them food, to come to knock on the door, to give them presents. It was a really good gestures that we keep on doing them even today. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, you know, that, that's lovely to hear all these wonderful insights from all around the world. Um, in, in Singapore, where I come from um, during the pandemic, it was difficult for many, um, especially for the family caregivers who are looking after those with um, Alzheimer's uh, and dementia conditions. Um, we did experience that um, a lot of caregivers had to um, look at ways to um, eventually enroll their loved ones into institutional care because they weren't, they weren't able to cope uh, with looking after uh, someone uh, at home. And we did see an increase, but you know, because um, Singapore also has um, uh, you know, we, we, although we have um, all these facilities, it was also challenging to find enough manpower uh, to, to run the facilities as well. So I think every country has its challenges, but, you know, it's wonderful here to see that everyone has found their own rainbows um, during the, the global pandemic situation. Um, our, our next um, question, which I we, we'd like to pose to our audience here um, and, and, and to, to the sp- panelists as well, because um, of your tremendous experience as well, is to put yourselves in the role of a minister for dementia in your country and what would you like to to do what would you like to say if you were in parliament today and addressing people as uh, in your in your first speech as minister of dementia what would you like to tell the world Uh, Meryl would you like to start first Uh, I would definitely say that we must take on the effects of COVID because it has a long tail and we must deal with the consequences. And the consequences are really the brain and mental health issues from COVID that predispose adults to dementia and other long-term neuropsychiatric conditions. So we're, we have to really pay attention to this now. The other thing is we need to track both the patient's disease progression and the caregiver's health because to, we need to evaluate and intervene with support services and training where it's needed. Um, I cared for my husband at home for 24 years and buried him the week before the world shut down. Now, my fear for all those years was whether I would wear out. Uh, fortunately, I didn't, but that was my in my mind. So we must focus as well on the health of the caregiver. And then think more broadly, teach risk reduction and prevention beginning in youth and across the lifespan, because we have to buy time for quality. We want our brain span to match our lifespan. So, but I think focusing on the the tale of COVID will be critical in any country. Great. Who wants to go next? I can go. (laughs) Yes, great. Uh, Well, I think one one topic that has not been so much discussed during this seminar is actually one of, I mean, caring about the the people suffering from dementia is important, but in my view, one of the most important things now also is to really uh, make sure that the researcher get the funding that that they need. And I think we need to redistribute funds from example, from cancer and, and uh, heart diseases to dementia. Because uh, in fact is that around 70% of all cancer diagnosis can be cured today. But if you get, for example, Alzheimer's, there is no cure. So I mean, uh, in order to, to stop this disease, the only way to stop it is to find a cure. And the only ones who can find a cure is the researchers, but they get far too little funding. And I mean, just in Sweden, I mean, 
we are one of the biggest financers in Sweden today, and we are a charity organization. We don't get, don't get any funding from the government. We only live on private donations. So I think the, uh, the redistribution of funds from the government is essential, but I also think that the business community has to, to come up on the market here. For example, big corporates, uh, banks, uh, insurance companies, but at the end of the day, it's their employees, customers who gets affected, and they have to help out because the cost, cost burden is so huge for this. So we need to, to really to have more people and, and, and corporates helping with the, with the funding. So, so I think that's one of the first thing I would do. I will also finish by saying that around 30 or 40% of the scientists uh, working time, they spend that on uh, applying for grants. This is totally ridiculous. So we need to have a much smoother system in order to distribute funds. So that's in my view, while the, the, all the people who suffer from dementia uh, with this horrible disease, uh, meanwhile, we need to, to, to um, ensure the funding to the research area. That's very important. Thank yeah. you. Great. I think maybe corporates don't even uh, I mean don't understand enough about what what is Alzheimer's. So you know there's there's more public education that can be done for that area certainly. Well, thank thanks for sharing that. Uh, we'll, 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 as minister for dementia, let's cut the red tape. Um, over to you, Kristen. Would you like to share? Absolutely. Thank you. I agree with what my fellow panelists have shared so far, and I would add to that. Um, there's so much to do, obviously, but I think prioritization would be enhancing a nationwide public health response to really create that population level change, uh, achieve a higher quality of life for those living with the disease and their caregivers and reduce associated costs. Also look to expand successful collaborative and coordinated dementia care models and create incentives and career pathways to recruit and retain healthcare professionals who specialize in geriatrics, gerontology, and dementia care as our seniors continue to grow up. Our nation's seniors in the United States continue to age in that greatest risk category for developing Alzheimer's or dementia. It's very critical right now that the stakeholders come together to ensure that we have an adequately trained and prepared dementia care workforce um, and also understand dementia care management and looking at really supporting paying for value of care instead of volume of care, which is how we're currently structured. And then lastly, I'd also want to just highlight addressing health disparities and discrimination as a barrier to Alzheimer's and dementia care and increased diversity in clinical trials and dementia care. The Alzheimer's Association conducted a survey um, that was just released recently in our 2021 Facts and Figures report, and our survey found that more than one-third of Black Americans and nearly one-fifth of Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans believe discrimination is a barrier to receiving Alzheimer's care. We also surveyed caregivers, and among non-white caregivers, half or more say they face discrimination when navigating healthcare settings for their care recipient. Um, we know that this is an ongoing challenge and also thinking about the research piece, if representation in dementia care research is not improved, our ability to determine whether findings <clears throat> vary by diverse subgroups is not possible. And that really holds us back in, in disease caregiving research. Um, if we continue to lack representation in Alzheimer's research, we won't have the benefit of looking at prevention, the risk reduction piece that Merle was discussing, treatment or care innovations. And so um, I would also seek to try to establish stronger relationships with existing organizations um, in, in communities of color and indigenous communities to really look at the potential of what those research-based partnerships could look like to enhance representation of research uh, and improve our outcomes and how we move forward. Great, thank you very much. Well, Fernando, let's hear, let's hear your perspective. Yes, thank you. So I can see two major problems in Latin America and specifically in Brazil. Uh, getting the timely diagnosis because uh, the system is not prepared and because of the stigma of the society, thinking that this is just normal aging, all the signs and symptoms. Uh, so uh, in denial of the diagnosis. Uh, for this problem, I would love to work in the schools for awareness campaigns because we can prepare a whole a entire generation more conscient about dementia and they're not doing that. And for me, this is a huge mistake. I worked with my books in some schools uh, for several years. And in the second year, uh, I had the surprise of a mom thanking me because the eight years old son came back from one of the lectures and said, 
there is something going on with grandpa. He's not just getting older. And they got the, the timely diagnosis, which is kind of rare here in Brazil. So I think this is a, it's a great move for awareness campaigns. And also the, the lack of resources to care for someone you love is so frustrating. And most of these families, they are giving up on their own lives to care for someone because there's few assistance. And to provide this care, they normally stay, let's say 10 years with this person, 10 years of their life, maybe in the 30s, in the 40s, or in the 50s. But all the assistance that I hear for dementia, uh, for the patient and for the family, goes until this patient death. And nothing is going after these families that uh, gave up on so much to care. And now they don't have education, uh, educational training, professional training. They are not in, this, in, the, in, the, in the system and probably they will be in an informal role for the rest of their lives and suffering with the lack of um, economic resources. So I would love to implement a restart project, for example, to help these families to restart their own lives and to, to go back to the market, to go back to professional life, to educational life. And I, I would love to do that. I took care of my grandma, but I was in my 20s. I had enough time to, to go back to my life, to go back to, to the university and to find a role in my life. But most of these families, they are in the 50s or even in the 60s, and there is no enough time to go back. Great, thank you. Well, Adi, let, let's hear from you. Yes, I would like to add some more ideas that we had do here in Israel that is a little bit different again. Well, the first thing that I wish that we continue is the awareness for the needs of these families that it's not only the needs in the pandemics, it's always, all the time, every day, all the year, not only now. And I hope that everybody will remember that. So we continue to contribute for them to contribute to the services that we can do. I think that it's very important to help for the families. The families are dealing with a lot when they are taking care of people with dementia. They need help, they need support, they need to learn techniques, how, what to do with them, how to cope with them. And that is very important. We in Nemda, we have a kind of this of, of a program, but it's a private one. People need to pay for it. I wish it was public and everybody could join it and everybody could, have, could use it because it's really an effective way of changing their own life. Another thing that we have is day centers, which we have few of them in the country, almost in every city, but they are really full because they are very small and we need more of them, but we need money to get to open them and to have all these kind of services. So I think that the end of it is money. We need to keep money, to get money for people with dementia, for the families, for their services. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, we, we've heard from all the panelists. Um, it's also time for the audience to share with us. Um, if anyone in the audience um, has the opportunity to be the Minister for Dementia, we'd love to hear your insights on what you would like to change or what you'd like to implement in your own countries. So as we keep the discussions going, please share with us your comments uh, for those of you in the audience here. Let us know what changes you would like to make in your country or what you would like to implement as Minister for Dementia. So we've heard um, quite a good roundup. Um, we want to cut the red tape. We want to increase awareness, um, make um, Alzheimer's on the target, um, not just on cancer. You know, when, when someone walks into a room and they get a diagnosis of cancer, it's, it's, it's true. You know, they, it, it's, it's a very challenging situation, but at least they do, they'll, they'll ask like, you know, what's the treatment? What's the treatment plan next? And, and there can be some um, opportunities and hope, um, but with, with, with Alzheimer's, it's a little bit different. Um, but you know, there's so much research out there um, that the researchers could be contributing towards getting the policy makers to change their minds and, and to implement uh, better work. Policy makers always want to see the evidence. And I think there is a lot of evidence that the, the researchers can provide. Um, hopefully we can cut the, the time that they take to get the funding grants. Um, so thanks, thanks for sharing those comments. Um, let's talk a bit um, about the informal caregivers. Um, I know Fernando also made a comment about informal caregivers in, in, his, uh, 
when we were exchanging some emails um, about that term informal caregivers, that classification name, um, was, you know, it's not totally appropriate um, for the roles that they are playing, but just for discussion's sake. And, and since everyone else knows the word informal caregivers and it's easy for people to relate to, um, you know, what what are what are some of the um, more obvious things that we could be helping with um, the informal caregiver force um, in in your own um, uh, communities that that could be changed? I know Fernando has shared some already. Um, do the rest of you want to share something in your own communities? Yes, I'd, no. I'd like to pick up on what Fernando said and also what Lisa said. Uh, in the US, uh, informal caregivers, we contribute about 75% of long-term care in the country. Uh, we also pay out of pocket. Long-term care is not subsidized by under Medicare. Unless you're bankrupt, you will, you will end up in Medicaid. So the system really does not support it. And many times, if you look at the average age of the caregiver today, uh, Fernando is young and caring. The average age is 49 or uh, 50. So you're losing a critical point in a career track and that you can't make up for. And Fernando made that point. So I think we really be, ought to be aware that families are going bankrupt because of this disease. Uh, so I think that we must pay attention because um, we have to assume that there is a value to the caregiver. And that's why this push both in the United States to begin looking at paying paid leave for the caregiver and also uh, some payment to the caregiver for the care that they have. The government has no plan B in the United States if the caregiver goes down. Mm. Great. Lisa, yeah. yes, uh, I would. Um, suggest so another idea that we are discussing here in Sweden, and that is to establish a sort of, uh, you could call it post-diagnosis care plan. I mean, people who get the diagnosis, and the younger you are, the worse it is. I mean, if you get Alzheimer's when you're 50 and you get that diagnosis, then you are just left alone. There's no plan, there's no rehab, there's nothing. If you suffer from cancer, you get a plan. Uh, treatment and so forth, but for Alzheimer's, there is no treatment. You get some pills, but you know that you will die from this disease. So I think you should, we should establish some sort of post-diagnosis plan uh, that should include concrete activities for the patient and for the loved ones. Um, it should be uh, exercise activities, uh, cost recommendations, various cognitive training, etc. It could also be support with legal uh, problems, I mean, uh, legal issues for the family and so forth. And I think uh, if that burden could be taken off the shoulders of the, of the patient and the, his or her loved ones, then they could have a better quality of life while the, the terrible uh, disease is developing. We, I meet mm -hmm. a lot of people who are in the mid fifties. And I mean, it's, yeah. it's worse enough, up, enough that you get the diagnosed, but then your whole life is ruined. You have children, you don't have the money, you don't, have the career, everything, and then you're just waiting for to die. It's, it's mm -hmm. terrible. So we need to have put something in place that we could help them because then I think you can have a good life even though you know what's happening. And I think it could also um, it could be easier to, to stand up with the disease if you if you are an active person. So that is something mm -hmm. I think we should try to implement. We are talking a lot about this in Sweden actually. Yeah, I, I think globally, maybe there's not enough awareness for people who get Alzheimer's at an earlier age. And a lot of the imagery in the, in the, in the media as well, um, from the movies or, you know, the, the way we put, put out all the images is all of older people who are grey. Um, I think that's also one factor. Um, there's also some questions from the audience talking um, about asking um, those of you who are in that um, journalism area, which uh, I, I think Meryl and Fernando are in. You know, there's so, so much power that... Um, you guys can convey um, using your your the role of the media in, in sharing the caregiving stories. Um, do you have any experiences with this on, on how the media has helped to share these caregiving stories? Yes, actually, we I have I have a, I study with a faculty member in, in Ireland to work with uh, storytelling and dementia because some years ago we had the shift from uh, creating narratives to trigger fear of the disease 
to actually what we are doing now, sharing narratives and, and using storytelling as a powerful tool to show people that you can still live with dementia. Uh, you're not dying, you're not suffering, with, you're living with something until the, the very last day of your life, but you're living with that. And so we had this shift of perspective and that's quite important here because when my grandma was di diagnosed in Brazil 15 years ago, the first article that I read, because after the 15 minutes um, appointment with the doctor, I didn't have any idea what I'm going, to, what I'm going through. I had to come back home and uh, search on Google Alzheimer's to understand a little bit better what my life will go to be like. And the first article, the title was um, normally, usually, family caregivers die before the patient because of depression and other pathologies. And I was, Jesus, <laughs> uh, the diagnosis is not mine and Google is, is still trying to kill me. That's unbelievable. And, and that's so negative. Every, that's why I, I insist in not using formal caregiver because we are, when we are caring for someone normally, we are working informally, studying formally, and we are in, in, an informal some, something else. And actually I try to empower these families showing, no, 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 no. You are the expert in this person's biography. You are the right person to care. You're not informal or anything. You're the best person to do that. So that, that's what I try to do, but I think the media is changing. All the movies, if you see some years ago, they were quite negative and, and they, they had this dark vibe on Alzheimer's in black and white, someone sat in a corner and we are trying to shift, showing some joy and well, you can still live and be yourself until the very last minute of your life. Mm. Yeah. Can I pick up, uh, and I love your passion, Fernando, and I'm sure you had a wonderful relationship with your grandmother, but the issue of nomenclature, when people are diagnosed earlier, and Lisa made this uh, comment very well, we now talk about people, not as patients, but those living with Alzheimer's. We need to give dignity to the moment because what do we do as spouses and uh, children? We protect a loved one's dignity as they go into the disease, but it's that sense of independence for as long as they can have it, to me, that is critical. The other reality in this disease is that when there is no cure for a disease, it tends to go romanticize at the edges. So it's a little old lady who can't remember her address when we're really talking about the cruelest of diseases. You know, a man's memory, said Aldous Huxley, is his personal narrative. We don't wanna lose who we are. So I think we need a new conversation and that's why you know, we go and protect our children with uh, early uh, cognitive testing for sports. We feel it's prevention. Why aren't we stepping up in mass and beginning to rethink how we deal about tracking cognition throughout our lives? Because uh, there are so many points that we need to learn. Uh, there's also the issue and the confusion, and Fernando, you brought it up again, what do we do when we get the diagnosis? There is such confusion between MCI and mild dementia. And at the National Institute of Health, they are spending three years trying to really uh, silo those so providers can tell us where our loved one is in that moment in the disease. So there are many issues in terms of nomenclature as well, but don't call me a caregiver. I was a spouse, I was a daughter. Um, so half the people don't even want to recognize, be recognized as caregivers. Can I add something? Of course. Thank you. Well, it's so important thing you said here, Marilyn. I wanted to tell something from our view. Well, we are in MDA, we believe in positive care of dementia. We believe that the family should look at it as something that is positive and learn the techniques and knowledge they can use to, to live with it. It's a very long journey. It takes a lot of energy. Take, there are a lot of 
or problems and things that the family deals with and everything is changing it's not like any kind other kind of a disease that you have something something happened you take a medicine you go to to the doctor you do something no it's a long it's a way of living that's why we have this unique program which we call in Israel Telem. It's in Hebrew, it's a meaning a road. And it's, a, it's the meaning for it, it's to support the families. It's a short term program and it's helping the families to identify their needs. And then we all help them to widen the circle of support and to get, get real practical ways to deal with dementia. How to help a man to go to, to take a shower, what to do with them, how to play with them, how to talk with them. It's so important and it's so helpful. We, we learn this from the United States by uh, Professor Mittelman, which uh, used this math. And I think it's a really good thing. It's really helped the families. We know that families who took this way and they got so much help that their life really changed in a positive way. And I really believe in this way. Fantastic. Well, that's great. Well, we're down to four minutes before the end of this um, very quick town hall. It's come, it's come to an end almost before we know it. Um, one of the comments from the audience today that I would like to read is from Emily. Um, as Minister for Dementia, she would like to get people living in dementia involved in the National Dementia Plan and make it urgent and high priority on the agenda. Um, and, you know, she says this, make nothing about us without us a reality. So thank you for sharing. Um, thanks for the audience for submitting your questions. Um, you know, we, we like to give this time to each of the panelists um, to give your closing thoughts on how you would like to improve the um, field of caregiving for persons with dementia. It could be professional education or it could be a national program. What are your closing thoughts about this? I'm happy to jump in there. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation so much and, and appreciate the, the comments from the audience. I agree with the comment that was shared um, just now. It's, it's so important that we raise the voices of those who are living with the disease and those family members who are participating in, in caregiving um, and in research. I think um, so much has been discussed today. At the end of the day, we need to care for our caregivers. We know that caring for an individual with dementia has a negative effect on employment, income, on somebody's personal health and can aggravate um, their health. We know the mental health challenges around depression and anxiety. Um, and as was shared earlier, we rely so heavily on our caregivers. Um, and so figuring out how we can best support them, um, whether it's financially, also with support groups, education, but to know that we're really acknowledging how important caregivers are in our society um, and where we would be without them in terms of dementia care. So grateful for the conversation and look forward to um, further discussions of how we can work together as a global community. Fantastic. Well, we just have one minute left. Um, anyone else wants to make a quick remark before we end the session? I think we should uh, try to, um, we need a consistent strategy for, well, elderly care and especially for people diagnosed with dementia. And I think we need to have a mission with the patient in focus. And that boils down to, in my view, to really make sure that we have good leaders uh, leading all these uh, retirements and, and uh, dementia homes. And because if you have an enthusiastic leader, I think the personnel would actually like to work and then and everything would be better if you have a good leader. Um, and I think we really have to, to provide the, these caregivers and the caregiving industry the right recognition in order for them to be able to, to execute their important task. And that boils down to, to dignity and to salaries and, and so forth. So it's a lot of things to be done in that area. And I think, uh, Kristen, you pointed out, and uh, it's very important to make sure that they have the right skills and there are education in place. But uh, the, the employers need to make sure that they have enough money in their budgets in order to make sure that their personnel can go through and, 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 uh, these uh, educations. So I think it's, it's a matter of giving them the right uh, reputation and recognition that they need. And this has to be done. We don't, the politicians cannot just talk about this. I miss the execution part. Fantastic. Let's just do it. Well, that's the message for today. Thank you very much to all our panelists uh, for joining us today. And thank you to our audience. Thank you very much for all that sharing. Thank you. Thank you.